Fear is a very powerful emotion. It can be paralyzing. Those kind of thoughts in our heads, uh, what if it doesn't work out? What will people think? What if I fail? What if I'm not good enough? That kind of fear can stop us from realizing our potential. Half the time though, fear is irrational. It's not based on anything real. It's completely false. We're worrying about things that haven't even happened yet, based on possibly things that have happened in the past, which you know, are disconnected from what's actually happening right now. But there's a darker side to fear as well. And fear can manifest itself in many different ways. You know, it can manifest itself physically. You know, um, a lot of people have a tension in their neck, in their jaw. I've had stomach uh, issues relating to fear. But it can also be used against us. We can be manipulated. Politics and politicians um, often use fear to get us to think a certain way, to vote a certain way. And, you know, you've all seen adverts for things like um, detergents, where they tell about the dangers of germs in your home and how um, only their product is good enough to, to keep you safe from all of these things lurking on kitchen surfaces and toilet seats. Fear, then, is very primeval. It's based on something that was designed to keep us safe from saber-toothed tigers and, and dangers in the forests hundreds of thousands of years ago, but now it lives on. You know, that fear you feel when you're asking your boss for a pay rise or for a holiday, that fear that stops you from speaking up, from taking the steps to creating a life that you love. But fear is also uh, keeps us separated. It can be used to divide us. We're seeing the manifestation of hundreds of years of manipulation through fear on the streets in America, in the UK, as finally people are standing up to injustice which is completely man-made and completely engineered based on fear. I wanted to find out more about fear because I've struggled with it myself, I still do. Every time I post a podcast, put something on Instagram, you know, put myself out there a little bit, I experience fear. What will people think? You know, so how do we go from being afraid uh, to putting ourselves out there and facing our fears? You know, how do we go, as Brené Brown said, uh, and dare greatly? I wanted to speak to an expert, so I, I reached out to Patrick Sweeney. Patrick is uh, the fear guru. He has his own experience of fear and how, for him, he used to hide it with things like alcohol and um, you know, bad habits that we often adopt so we don't have to face up to reality. And then he realised that fear was preventing him living a full life, so he researched into it and looked into it and then devoted his life in the end to combating fear. And the best way to tackle fear is to face more of it, according to Patrick. He's written a book, it's a number five on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. It's called Fear is Fuel. If you want to find out more about Patrick, his website is pjsweeney.com and he's also on Twitter, at pjsweeney. Here is Patrick giving up some time to talk to me about fear and how we can use it to drive us to be better, to live better lives, and to be more compassionate and understanding towards others. And also to recognise when our fear is being manipulated to benefit others, or at the very least, to keep us divided from other people who are just like us. Hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did, and I hope you will go on to look within yourself to find out where that fear is that's actually stopping you from being better and living a fuller life. So Patrick Sweeney, thank you so much for joining me on my podcast. You are the fear guru. And um, I've been wanting to talk to someone about fear for a long time because fear um, is certainly quite prevalent in my life. You know, it's quite, um, you know, even things like uh, talking to my boss or um, dealing with people in authority. You know, you get that sense of kind of fear in here, but it, it also manifests in, in lots of different ways in society. Um, in ways that we don't necessarily see or understand or uh, which aren't obvious at first. Um, so I thought it would be good to speak to someone who knew all about fear. And, um, and you seem to be the right person for the job. Um, and you've also got a book coming out. It's a Wall Street Journal bestseller. So we'll talk a little yeah. bit about that later on. But maybe you could tell us well, about your story, if that's okay. Well, well, Chris, first of all, thank you so much for having uh, me on the show and, and thank everybody as well for tuning in and taking time. I know it's a chaotic time. People have a lot of opportunities, so I really appreciate tuning in. 
And uh, I'd love to tell you about the, really the past six or seven years, I've been doing neuroscience research. I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist, so more focusing on the neuroscience aspect of how the brain works. And what I found was really fascinating. And particularly if, if fear is getting in your way in any uh, way, shape or form, or if you haven't felt like you've reached your potential or you haven't felt like all your dreams have come true, the key to it really can be unlocked with the neuroscience and once we understand the brain. So the book, as you mentioned, uh, I think fortuitously hit number five on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list uh, when it came out just over a month ago. And um, I think the reason is so many people want to know how the brain works and, and literally how we can reprogram it. So uh, that's, that's what I've been helping a lot of people do now because the... Uh, the, the brain is, you know, our, uh, the most amazing organism ever developed, yet the biggest thing that gets in our way. <laughs> well, that's really fascinating because I've talked to some, some people recently about things like neuroplasticity and, and this kind of thing about um, kind of you build these pathways. And um, the, the more you repeat these, these kind of practices, beliefs, ideas, the more ingrained these pathways get. And I, I suppose that's, that's how we can become a little bit pre-programmed. And that's how fear becomes such a kind of um, ingrained part of our, our psyche, if you like. So how do we undo that programming then to kind of get over these internal roadblocks? I think the first step, Chris, is people need to understand that the brain is a prediction engine. So what we were, what we were designed to, to do uh, two million years ago, our ancestors created this early warning system for danger, and it's called yeah. the amygdala. The amygdala is a little gland that sits at the base of your brain, uh, and it, it instigates the fight, flight, or freeze response. And, and so what our brain constantly tries to do, the, the brain being this prediction engine, is it tries to, to forecast every moment. So, for example, when you walk into a room and uh, it's dark and you go to flip the light switch on, and you flip the switch, your brain's predicting there's a 95% chance the light's gonna come on and maybe a 5% chance it won't come on. If it doesn't come on, then your brain further predicts there's an 88% chance that the uh, bulb is burnt out and a 12% chance the circuit uh, breaker has flown. And so, so we're constantly going through these things based on what's happened in our past. So, so we use what neuroscientists call our prior beliefs which are all of our past experiences to predict outcome of the future. So now if you went up to that same light bulb and you unscrewed it and 50 baby snakes came slithering out all over you, you'd freak out because it's probably not one of your prior beliefs. It's not something that, that got put in and, and programmed into your, this amazing hard drive we have called the subconscious mind. The subconscious can that it can store as much information as 500 of the most expensive Apple uh, MacBooks you can find. So you can imagine just the, the vast amount of data. But, but the thing that's incredibly messed up, Chris, is we don't populate that data. So, so all of the things, all the ways that we're making predictions and subconscious decisions, all of that has been populated in general by other people. So we don't choose where we're born, we don't choose what language we speak. We don't choose how many brothers and sisters we have. We don't choose the color of our skin. We don't choose where we went to school. Yet all of these things create an, uh, uh, our prior beliefs that we're comfortable with and that we fall back on for decision making. So, so uh, you know, I, I tell everyone that that's the most fucked up thing about our life is that our programming was done by somebody else. Yeah. So what, if we want to change that programming, the way that you look at it is we have to change our future pasts, which, which sounds a little bit trippy, but because we're making our past, our, our past is making all these decisions for us now, if we can stop when something happens and we can consciously change what we think, then the next time in the future, when that happens again, the, the way that we want to decide, not our parents, not our teachers, not our coaches, the way that we want to decide becomes our default. So it's, it's really a, uh, an amazing thing. You mentioned the neuroplasticity, which is true. The, the neurons that you fire together 
will wire together. And so that's why you have to continue to practice this thing. And, and, and the fear response that you also mentioned can be our, our biggest source of, of fuel. So that's, that's, I think, what's really most interesting. I mean, you've mentioned before that the, um, the way to kind of overcome fear and even, even use fear to, to your benefit is to, to seek out more of it. But the problem with fear is that it's kind of a little bit frightening. So how do you, how do you get over <laughs> how do you, How do you face that and, and embrace it and use it as, as fuel without being scared and, and running away and hiding? Well, that's that, so the, the first thing, Chris, is you have to make the choice, right? And you have to believe that you can change your brain. You have to believe in neuroplasticity. You have to believe that you can become creative at any age. You have to believe that you can become brave at any age because you can. And all of the science out there is, uh, is there to prove it. And, and, you know, a lot of people have misconceptions about the brain because psychology was a trial and error science uh, just up until a few years ago. We haven't, we haven't had the technology to really look inside the brain until maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And so psychology, we never knew if, you know, if a cigar was just a cigar or were we in love with our mother, right? Yeah. <laughs> because people were just coming up with theories. And, and the brain was the last part of the body that we actually had technology to do diagnostics and, and, and evaluation and that sort of thing. So I think you know, one of the interesting things is understanding how the brain works gives you the power to understand how to change it. So that's why the neuroscience is so important. And, and this is what I go through in the book is explaining the neuroscience. The amygdala is running this two million year old piece of software. And it's programmed for fight, flight, or freeze. That's it. It's your default defense. And, and if you look back to 2 million years ago, what that meant is anytime we felt uncertainty, for a caveman in general, uncertainty meant death, right? In, in most instances, if you couldn't predict. So anytime we felt uncertainty, we'd run back to our cave. And, and now we, you know, we don't have a cave today. I, I'd say the metaphorical cage is the couch, right? Because that's where we feel safe and that's where we can go back to. And, and you might have a really cool man cave or she shed for your wife. But, <laughs> but besides that, you know, the, the metaphorical cave now is probably the couch. And people will want to go back there. And the, the mental cave, I would say, is wanting to be right. Because when, whenever we find uncertainty, whether it's, whether it's physical or whether it's mental or emotional, when we find that uncertainty, we want to go back to where we know uh, things are safe, to where they worked in the past. So when someone has a different point of view, when someone looks different from us, when someone suggests different things, our brain says, well, is this a friend or is this a foe? We don't know. So we're going to default back to our defenses. We're going to default to, to a shadow version of ourselves. If you're conservative, you get more conservative. If you're liberal, you get more liberal. So that's what happens. That initial reaction of the amygdala wants us to, to run back to the cave. Now, if, if we're much more cognizant of that, then, then when we feel that change, you, you touch your chest. So I'm, I'm guessing when you start to feel nervous or when yeah. your boss calls you in or you get a, uh, you know, an email or something like that, that's where you feel it. We all feel it in different places, but it's all generally the same. So that's the reason that I say we should scare ourselves every day. And you don't have to jump out of an airplane. You can, you can get up at lunch and make a toast or you can sing karaoke or you can, you know, ask that girl at the gym out for a date or something like that. Any, anything that makes you uncomfortable, if, if you have a motivation that goes beyond you, that becomes easier. If you have an altruistic motivation, then it's easier to be courageous. If you understand that we literally can make the choice to shut off our fear center, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a nerd alert here just for your, so your listeners <laughs> don't get too. Uh, there's an a area in our brain that's newer and, and it's weaker. It's called the SGACC, the subgenial anterior cingulate cortex. And that's our courage center. So we can actually make that stronger and we can decide to use the courage center or decide to use the fear center 
for our decisions. So the reason I say scare yourself every day, even if it's something that you just feel uncomfortable, if you lean into it, then you're gonna do exactly what you said, Chris, with, with neuroplasticity. You're gonna fire those neurons that connect to the courage center, and those neurons that fire together will wire together. So how do we, um, so, you, I mean, you have to want to do it. So it's, I guess it's a bit like um, when you're overweight and you want to lose weight, you have to make a decision. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the action necessary to lose weight. I'm gonna get exercise, I'm gonna change my diet, this kind of thing. And, you know, it's the same if you want to run a marathon, you have to practice running the marathon, you run to the end of the road, then you run a little bit further. But how can we do this to kind of, I don't know what, what I don't know what I'm looking for, really. How can we use this? To kind of, I, I, I think you're looking for the motivation. Is what yeah, it, it sounds like so I, I, you know, for me, and what I talk about in the book is, um, I believe, uh, so there's two, two things. I believe that uh, we make decisions one of two ways in our life. We either make them based on fear or we make them based on opportunity. You make a decision based on fear, it's always going to lead to regret, to shame, and failure. You make a decision based on opportunity, as uncomfortable as it feels when you do it, it's going to lead to happiness, success, and, and fulfillment. And so if you look back, so the, the thing that, that happened to me is my, the, the first 35 years of my life, I was, I was living the diary of a wimpy kid. I was afraid of everything. I mean, I was af uh, afraid of failure. I had fear of abandonment, fear of rejection. And I was absolutely terrified to fly in an airplane. And so consequently, I ended up, uh, you, you know, I was running one of the hottest technology companies in the USA. And I was scared of everything, scared of board meetings, scared of customer engagement, scared of my best employees leaving. And so just to keep the, the anxiety wolves at bay, I was drinking six or seven beers every day and, and twice that on weekends, just, just so I could you know, feel normal. And that lifestyle, the constant anxiety, I had the, the stress hormone, cortisol, was just coursing through my body from a fire hose and I couldn't shut it off. So the drinking was the only way I could feel you know, somewhat in control without all that anxiety. And so the cortisol and the anxiety and the stress all led to what, what almost ended up being disaster. And uh, I, I, I got really sick, went to my GP. He said, you know, I don't know what it is, but you've got no immune system. So we're going to send you to Johns Hopkins. And I went up to Hopkins, my, my one-year-old daughter, uh, went to her grandparents' house, and my wife and I endured this battery of tests at Hopkins, which culminated in this nightmare scenario of Dr. McHale coming in and saying, look, leukemia is very rare, rare, and uh, we suggest you put your affairs in order and say your goodbyes. And, <laughs> and my wife, who was six months pregnant at the time, went into shock. And I know, I mean, imagine how I felt. <laughs> and, and so I had this incredible sense of regret because I felt like I was robbed or I, I was cheated from my life. Because, because that fear of flying, I looked back, no, you know, partying spring breaks, no family reunions, no incredible uh, school exchange programs. All of those were buried for me because of fear. And so yeah. I got on my deathbed and I looked back with this non-terrible sense of regret. And, and that's what happens to people who live their life in fear. And if you don't want to get to the end of your life and say, my God, I never took that I never took that trip to New York. I never, uh, I never did that bungee jumping, you know, challenge. I never sang karaoke. Uh, and now I look back and, and I wonder why I worry so much because I'm going to die anyways. So I think the the motivation um, and, and one thing that I, I very sincerely believe is all our dreams are on the other side of fear. Yeah. So you have to get you have to get to that fear first and get to the other side, and then you just realize how amazing your life can be. So if you have that motivation, then what you'll look for is a set of tools or a, a process, and that's what I can help with that 
that allow you to, to look and evaluate and, and realize, okay, I'm feeling the amygdala wanting to run back to the cave. I can feel that now. And the first thing that I should do, so I created this platform in the book, Chris, that I think you know about called the base platform. And that first B is breathing. So first acknowledge the feeling and say, yeah, my amygdala is exploding in these warning signals for me, but I'm going to take a breath. And the, one of the easiest things that I coach people and I've got CEOs all over the world doing this uh, and, and, and second grade teachers and house moms and, and professional athletes are all doing the same thing. The first thing is when you feel that, breathe in to a count of four. Hold it for a count of four, and then out for a count of four, then hold it out for a count of four. So this, this breathing around that four, four, four is what I call a four by four. Okay. And it, what happens, I'll, I'll give you another nerd alert here <laughs> for your listeners. So if it, that's called bottoms up information in neuroscience. So if your amygdala activates because it's something that might be uncertain or, or a threat and it wants us to fight or flee back to the cave, then your breathing shallows and quickens. So if you change your breathing like that, you're sending a very powerful signal to your brain that says we're not under threat because we're breathing normal. So you take back control of the, of the sympathetic nerve system and you get back in control, but you still have those fear changes, those chemicals that make you smarter and make you stronger. So that's why I say you can use fear as fuel. And the base methodology, that just that breathing. In fact, if you practice that breathing every morning, so you wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is a little gratitude is thank God that I'm above the dirt. And you can thank Allah or the universe, or it doesn't matter. Just be grateful for waking up. And then just do three minutes, four minutes of four by fours like that. And literally within three days, you'll change the cellular structure of your brain by, by doing that breathing. This is why meditation is so powerful. But people think, well, I don't want to sit on a cushion for an hour. You don't have to. If you wake up every morning and you do that focused breathing for three or four minutes, then when the amygdala activates and tries to hijack your thought process, you've already trained yourself to feed that information just by doing the breathing. So when you do the breathing then, it becomes really powerful in, in getting back under control and it allows you to move forward even when you're feeling that discomfort of, of uh, fear. You talked a little bit about bitterness and that kind of resentment that life is so unfair and I've missed out. And and you, you said that that kind of motivated you to kind of change things, change your, your life. Um, yeah. But you'd already achieved some success. Um, well, I say some success, a lot of success in, you know, you'd um, been involved in, in technology startups that have, have done very well. Um, RFID, that was one of the technologies you were involved with, wasn't it? Which is now absolutely everywhere. Um, so, I mean, was fear driving your success? Because I, I know with me, fear has always been th something that's made me think, well, why bother? I'm not going to, I'm not going to succeed anyway. So, but I know other people use it to kind of step up a little bit, even though in the end, you know, they, they burn out or they, they feel completely dissatisfied. Uh, what drove you? Because I mean, you, you were doing pretty well, even though it, on your website, you say that your whole life you'd lived as a, a coward, essentially, up until that point. Yeah. You, you know, uh, I, I look back and I often tell people, so I, I spent six years training for the Olympics and yeah. finished second in the, the Olympic trials and raced the World Cup for three years. Uh, and, and I say, you know, I could have been an Olympic gold medalist. Or uh, my first company was the first cloud hosting company called Server Vault. And I raised uh, $3 million in venture capital and debt. And I say I could have been a billionaire. So mm -hmm. I had all these incredible opportunities, um, but fear was what was holding me back. And in fact, because I grew up uh, in a very blue collar area of Boston, my parents were first generation immigrants and, and uh, we, we grew up very poor. Um, no one in my family went to university till I did. And so I had, uh, I was, you know, bullied as a kid, my grandfather thought the way to teach us to be tough was to put us over his knee and, and whip us with his leather belt. And, uh, and so I grew up with no self-esteem. And then I had so much shame 
that I, I, you know, I tried to build up this persona. I tried to hide, you know, literally in my, my cave of my own design. I didn't want people to know I was scared all the time. I didn't want people to know um, that I was uh, afraid of, you know, failure, afraid of rejection or abandonment. So I, I kept trying to build up this image. And I see this a lot with, with particularly uh, executives that I work with. You know, the, the more successful, you know, powerful and rich they are, oftentimes the more they're trying to cover up what's really gone, going on inside their mind. And that was exactly what happened to me. And so I can, I can you know, remember with crucial clarity, Chris, the going to uh, having a board meeting when I'm running, you know, my first company, Server Vault, which should have been amazing. We were the first ones to, to decide, you know, to create a cloud platform, a secure cloud platform. And I should have been excited with every board meeting, working on strategy in a real team environment. But instead, I was afraid that I wouldn't look like the perfect CEO. So I'd spend literally a week prepping for this meeting, not looking for information, just making sure my, my, I made myself look good. And, and, and that was the missed opportunity. I had you know, smart people in the, in the room. I had a board that you know, could have been strategic and, and I should have been changing some of the board members to make it better. And, but I was just afraid of everything. And so that fear for me, very clearly, when I look back on my life, uh, and, and in fact at Hopkins, one of the things that happened when I'm sitting there laying there thinking I'm going to die after all, and this is what it all comes down to, I thought back to my daughter. And I thought, my God, is the memory she's going to have of her dad, a guy who's too afraid to get on a plane and take her to Disney or take her to Paris or show her the world. And I thought, my God, she deserves better than that. And so, so my motivation ended up being driven by my family and driven by my love. And that's when courage became center to me. So as soon as I got out of Hopkins, the first stop, once I got my immune system back, was the Leesburg Airport. And I went to take flying lessons. And, oh, okay. and I, I must have peed four times before I got in the plane that first, that first time. I was petrified. But I did it, and I did it with the idea that if I take this flying lesson, I'm going to save my daughter's life, right? I, I, I looked at it that way because I knew I'd run into a burning building to save her. So I thought, if, I can, if this is going to save her life. The second, the second lesson was even more terrifying because we, we flew away from the airport, went over you know, some, some hills, and hit a bunch of turbulence. And I actually think I pooped myself, not just like a little bit, not, not, not a lot. <laughs> And, uh, and, and so, but the, the really interesting thing was I was incredibly good at flying because I had the fear response all the time yeah. and I could see things, everything was in super high definition, right? HD, things were super saturated. So because my body had prepped to fight or flee, I had, you know, shuts down everything non-essential and now I could see better, I was stronger, my mind was working quicker because there was more oxygen to it, my, my eyes and ears were open more and taking in more information, this is the fear response. So I was actually turned out to be a, a really good pilot and then something absolutely miraculous happened. After about the fourth or fifth flying lesson, I fell in love with flying. Wow. And I got to the other side of my fear. So I got my commercial pilot's license. I got my uh, instrument rating. I got my seaplane license. And now today, I fly a stunt plane in airbag competitions, oh right? God. Just the most complete thing that would have terrified me even to talk about 15 years ago is one of my greatest senses of joy and fulfillment and happiness. So if I never faced the fear, I would have never found this source that's, that's such a, a, a great source of enjoyment and pride to me. And I certainly would have never seen the world like I have or given my family the opportunities I have. I mean, it's, it sounds almost like you, you kind of experienced a, an altered state of consciousness in a way. You kind of um, harnessed yes. the kind of feelings of fear and the, the state of fear, but made it work for you rather than against you. And, and that's a, there's, there's a, a psychological um, uh, phenomenon where oftentimes people who, who end up, you know, in a concentration camp, uh, stuck on a, you know, on a um, desert island or, or even, you know, a lot of explorers who, who sign up for something and end up getting, 
you know, having this incredibly difficult trip across the Antarctic. They have this, this uh, epiphany, like you're saying, this, this change in their life and their mindset. And they realize that, that, you know, what we've been listening to has been that subconscious, those prior beliefs, and those were all put there by other people. Now, your relationship with your parents, I haven't met, you know, maybe 1% of parents who aren't trying to do the absolute best they can for their, for their kids. Now, they might not do it well, but they're trying their best, and everyone has the best of intentions. But that doesn't mean that that's what we should go through life using to make our decisions. So we've got to be conscious about it. And oftentimes, it's not until we get in one of these incredibly high-stress situations where all of a sudden the the uh, computer that's running that two million year old software reboots itself and we realize what's happening. We, we look around and we think, okay, I'm gonna be on my deathbed and because uh, my parents said it was, uh, you know, I had to be married to only one man, I've never remarried and I've missed out on intimacy for the past 10 years since my husband died and, and my life is miserable. And, and so it's, you know, an epiphany like that, or someone finally gets made, uh, get, gets fired or gets made redundant in their job that they've been at it 20 years. And they said, you know, I always wanted to, uh, I always wanted to be a novel writer, but I stuck with my job because I thought it was safe. And then they had this epiphany. So there are oftentimes very stressful things, but what I hope and, and my goal for people is they, they find the realization that if they really want to live their dream life, they have to create that epiphany for themselves and start reprogramming their mind on their own. Yeah, that's um, interesting, isn't it? Because um, a lot of people, and I've spoken to people who've kind of had spiritual awakenings, people who've um, you know been through life-changing experiences and then come out and kind of recreated themselves afterwards. There, there always seems to be this this moment, this kind of crisis or trauma that that triggers it, and you know some people call it an awakening or a rebirth if you like but um yeah. I, i've kind of spoke to a couple of people how you know do we have to go through that kind of life-changing moment of of being on top of a mountain or being close to death or being kind of you know in the, the midst of the worst depression ever to in order to come out you know like the lotus flower growing on mud if you like is there a way of just even if life is perfectly adequate right now and i'm just dissatisfied and a bit little bit fed up with the way things are progressing how can i you know relaunch myself and yeah of, yeah you know. and and that's that's the whole point of the book chris so the reason um once i got out of hopkins and then all of a sudden i went, went from being you know diary of a wimpy kid to captain courageous yeah <laughs> i wondered how does this happen so that's when i started talking to the first neuroscience neuroscientist here at Tufts University. And then he said, oh, you should go sit down with um, Dr. Orr, Scott Orr from Harvard because he's doing a lot of stuff with changing PTSD. So I went and sat with Scott and he said, oh, you should go see Dr. Anna Byler at MIT because she's doing a ton of stuff with it. So I started just having coffee because I was trying to figure out what happened in my brain, how it could change like that. And then what, what ended up happening for me was I realized anybody can do this. So you don't have to go through the, the near-death experience. What you have to do is you have to understand how the brain works, and then you have to start to take advantage of that and, and start to leverage that knowledge. And the easiest way to do it, like you said, if you're, if you're living a, a, a life where you're you know, maybe just a little bit dissatisfied and, and things aren't working as, as you are, the first thing you have to do is make sure you've got a creator mindset. So having the mindset where you actually believe that you're in charge of your life and your world. So, so many people I see, Chris, that I talk with at my seminars or, or on keynote speeches for, for corporations, they have this victim mindset, you know, and you can even hear it in their language. Oh, I would have been on time, but the traffic was, was horrible. You know, I, I would have got that promotion, but my boss is an asshole. Yeah. I would have got, you know, this. And so they're a victim. And, and uh, you know, I like to think of this, the victim triangle, right? If you're a victim, there's always someone to blame it on, and that's a villain. And the only way that you can get saved is if you find a hero. And so you've got this victim, villain, hero triangle that you see with so many people. And those are the people that life is happening to. Yeah. Right? Life happens 
to them. You take that same triangle and you become the creator of your life, then someone who's going to be you know, the jerk, the hard person, they're a challenger. So they're challenging to make you a better version of yourself. And if you need help, then you've got a coach, not a hero. So my coach, when I was training for the Olympics, he never got in the boat and pulled for me, right? Yeah. He yelled from the side. So that, that coach isn't going to solve your problems, but they can give you advice. So that's a creator triangle instead of the victim triangle. And that's when life happens by you. You start to design your own life. You start to take accountability and believe, hey, I'm in charge and everybody here is here to serve me. Everybody here is to, here to teach me a lesson. Now, what happens is oftentimes those lessons are incredibly uncomfortable, Chris, and we're seeing this right now in the, in the George Floyd movement and some of the Black Lives Matter because people grew up in different tribes. So these new and uncertain perspectives and these new and uncertain ideals are scaring them. And when they scare them, they go back to that, to that victim triangle and they go back to a really uh, a shadow version of themselves because they're scared. And yeah. so if you recognize that and you can replace that judgment with curiosity, that becomes the real center to, to lasting change. And then you start to, you start to see, so the, the amazing thing about courage and reprogramming your mind is it has this incredible halo effect on your whole life. So I, my goal come, getting out of Hopkins was to get over this fear of flying. But just taking that action and starting to fire that courage center and getting used to using it, my business took off and I was working a lot less. My relationships got better. I stopped drinking. All of these things started to happen because of that first initial courageous step. It, it had this incredible halo effect on the rest of my life. And, and I think that's the biggest benefit that people start to see when they say, oh, you know, I would have, I would have never gone and, and uh, you know, asked that person for help. I would have never gone and, and uh, asked that guy out at the gym. I would have been too, you know, my mother said, good girls don't ask guys out or, you know, all these things from our past. And all of a sudden you start to see how the courage just absolutely changes your life. You talked earlier about you know, our, our fears and our experiences, they're kind of given to us half the time by, you know, this previous programming is given to us by our parents, by school or the school system. I mean, is it, yeah. I mean, would you say that um, almost the way the system runs, society, the media, the way we're brought up is to kind of reinforce a status quo on behalf of other people? And actually we're, in, in some ways, our, our own fear is being weaponized against us um, in order to, you know, keep keep certain sections of society uh, where they are and other sections of society performing better, perhaps? Yeah, so I, I think you're hitting on two really important and, and quite different uh, perspectives there, Chris. The, the first, uh, in terms of the, the school system and parenting, I think the past really two generations have done a tremendous disservice to their children. Uh, not necessarily on purpose, but because of their own fear. So yeah. I think that the fact uh, that, that the, particularly in the United States and the UK, uh, families have grown up a lot more affluent than they used to be. And, and so we're not worried about any of sort of the basic needs that, that, you know, to keep us alive and that sort of thing. And so we have a lot of uh, what I call bulldozer parents. They're trying to smooth the path for their kids so there, there are no bumps in the road. And that means moving them from, you know, piano practice to football practice to uh, Mandarin Chinese practice, you know, all scheduled, all after their school. And then you see people because, uh, because you know, bad things happen. That's just the way life is. But as soon as someone falls off a merry-go-round, the, the people, you know, in the town are now saying, okay, well, that thing, so it doesn't spin anymore because yeah. another kid might get hurt and break his arm. And, and, and so these bulldozer parents have tried to make their life. And, and what, what they're doing is, is usually two things. One, they're legitimately trying to take away the suffering and the hardship from their children, which is a, is a great intention, but is tremendously bad for the children because the children don't learn how to deal with hardship and challenge on their own. 
especially when the stakes are, are low and, and you know, there's not much to, to imagine. And two, uh, it puts a burden on the children to think someone's gonna bail them out. So they, they get put into that victim mindset. So when someone says, you know, if, if a kid pushes you around at school, you don't do anything, you go to the bully control officer and yeah. report it. And so then the kids learning from five years old, six years old, seven years old, somebody else is gonna solve their problems. Somebody else is gonna take on their challenge. And then when things are so scheduled, they don't have the ability to be bored, right? There was a, a great study that came out last year. They, were, they tested a bunch of university kids where they brought them in and they wouldn't let them use their phone for 45 minutes. And they said, you can sit for 45 minutes and we'll pay you uh, $20 to sit for the, the 45 minutes as part of the study. Or uh, if you can't sit for, 25, for 45 minutes, you can get an electric shock and you can get out in 20 minutes and still get the, still get the $20. And uh, I can't remember what the exact number was, but something like 65% decided to get the shock <laughs> because they couldn't sit for 45 minutes alone with their own thoughts. And so that's one of the reasons why depression and suicide and everything else is, is at an all time high because kids haven't learned these coping strategies and these mechanisms to deal with, uh, to deal with failure, to deal with conflict, to deal with um, unstructured time in their life. And so I think you know, the, the schools, and, and what happens with that, Chris, is a lot of parents are afraid to be perceived as bad parents, right? Yeah. If, if your son wants to go rock climbing, go climb a tree uh, outside, you know, behind school, you might say, no, 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 you can't do that because you're afraid of looking like a, um, you know, an inadequate parent that let his kid climb up the rocks or climb up the tree and then, you know, you may, might be afraid something got hurt. So it's the parents' fears now that are getting projected on the kids as well. And, and it's just, you know, that, that part is really a vicious cycle. Absolutely. And, I mean, do you think that um, the, you talked earlier about the fear of, uh, things that are different and the fear of the unknown. Do you think this is kind of fear is causing divisions? Do you think fear is a part of the reason that we're seeing so much kind of police brutality perhaps, or um, these confrontations on the street? Can we, is there, is there a way of using fear to unite people rather than divide them? Well, you know, Gandhi said it best, Chris, that, that hate isn't the enemy, fear is. And um, the problem is now, Fear is probably the most effective marketing tool available to people. So politicians and, and companies use fear and, and use our ability to, to, to surrender to fear as, as their primary weapon. And from a marketing perspective, I, you know, I'll go back to the kids once more because I was in London uh, just before Christmas and I was uh, sitting in the hotel room, just you know, flipped on the, the television in the morning and they had this, this great scene, and I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it was a, a dad and his son, and they were out in the swing set, you know, pushing in this wonderful music, and, and they're happy and laughing. And then they cut to the kitchen where the mom was inside cooking, and the father came in, white as a ghost, screaming, you know, call the ambulance, call the and And they showed the lifeless kid underneath the tree, and, uh, and it was an ad for a fucking ambulance company. And she looked at the camera at the end and she said, oh, thank God, you know, uh, Nigel's ambulance was just 30 seconds away and saved us. And, and my God, you're, you're thinking, so here's something that is absolutely preying on the fear of people, right? Every, every parent's worst nightmare that something's gonna happen. But now what's gonna happen because of that is, kids are gonna keep their kids off of swing sets because they see a point of reference that goes into their prior beliefs that playing on a swing set means the kid's about to die. And the uncertainty of that fires off our, our fear response. So it's those, those type of marketing messages that if you can't recognize that fear response, if you can't understand the absurdity of that and, and the risk associated with it, not the fear, but the risk, there's, you know, whatever the numbers are, there's uh, 100 million children who play on swing sets every year and, uh, you know, two die. So, so you're, you, you know, it just understanding the real risk. When you see it on TV, 
it, it, it's a fear response that now gets put into those prior beliefs. So I think that the fact that um, politicians use a fear to drive a wedge in between us, the way they do is by, by associating you with a certain tribe. So we're not individuals. We're a part of the same community. We're a part of the same profession. We're a part of the same, um, you know, team, that sort of thing. And that's why you see uh, soccer hooligans, right? F football yeah. uh, hooligans fighting, right? Literally killing people over a silly game. You know, when you step back and you look at it and you look how lives changed, that's all because of fear. It's because one tribe is, is, is looking at this other tribe and saying they're not like me. So they're judging them. And when they judge them and, and they appear different, then what happens is you get a tremendous fear response. And when we get the fear response, we default to defense. There's two defenses, fight or flee. Right, a freeze is another one more extreme, but but what we're seeing now is people are either fighting because someone is challenging their beliefs and is challenging the certainty that they live with. So our brain doesn't want to deal with that uncertainty, and so we've got those two responses: fight or flight. And that's that's what we're seeing happening. Uh, whether it's you know you're part of the police or you're not part of the police, you're a protester or you're not a protester. And even now, what's been, been politicized, uh, which, which blows my mind, is wearing a mask. So yeah. this bullshit in the United States, right, if you're, if you're uh, a real conservative and you believe in political freedom, you won't wear a mask. And it, it's ridiculous. It's like saying, you know, I wouldn't wear a parachute jumping out of a, a plane because, you know, the liberal side said we all have to wear parachutes. <laughs> I mean, it's just... It's, it's really, when you can step back and look at it from the perspective of people just being afraid. I'm, I'm very fortunate uh, in my town here in Boston, one of my best friends is a police officer and he's the only black police officer on the force. And so he and I have talked a lot about this since everything's been happening. And his feeling is, uh, so he's an he's a immigrant from Jamaica uh, who grew up as a, you know, as a boy in the Bronx in New York came to uh, Boston, came to this area of Boston for high school and fell in love with it. So his whole goal and desire was to give back to the community and protect this community that he loved. So he became a police officer in a, in a very white town in a in very white part of, of New England. And it, it's been his career for 20 plus years and he absolutely loves it. He really feels hurt because, you know, as he says, the 1%, has made the 99% look like, you know, become villains, basically. And, and you know, he's got a, such a, an interesting perspective on it, as, as do so many. But what happens in the media is it's just now it's everything's the police against us, right? So there's a wedge driven in between us instead of trying to understand, you know, the, the different factions and, and how someone is terrible or, or the people is terrible is what happened in Minneapolis. Can, how do they get to that point where they have the, the power and the control to do that? Why don't we have people like my friend, you know, in, in that position all, all over the place? And, and instead of asking those questions and being curious, people are trying to drive a wedge and trying to create that fear that anytime you see someone in a blue uniform, that's bad and they're gonna hurt you, right? And, and, and that's where, you know, the fear comes in. It's really interesting. I, I, I know we're a little bit short of time, so I just, um... Uh, kind of want to get on to your your book shortly, but um, there's just two more very quick points. It, it seems to me that there's this kind of, um, if you want to call it a kind of bro space that you see in kind of boardrooms, and you see this. We talked about it before. This kind of aggression that comes out when you're when you're suppressing your your fear, and then, but it's but that is too often confused with courage. You know, you often see courage as these big acts of bravery. When actually yeah. it's probably more courageous to kind of just peacefully, calmly, you know, recognize each other as, as being different and from different tribes, but maybe just step forward to have a conversation rather than to, you know, f fight it out almost. And, and the same in, in positions of authority when you're a chief executive or something like that, when you, you could bang your fist on the table and, and intimidate people and bully people. 
but that's actually a fear response and not a bravery response at all or a courageous response. That's exactly right, Chris. Yeah, and 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 the one of the scariest things for people, particularly the the most physically courageous people, one of the scariest things is to be emotionally vulnerable. Yeah. Right. And and so I see this a lot. Again, you know, I work with uh, quite a few CEOs across the world. And one of the things that, uh, and I've, I've worked with Special Forces and Navy SEALs here in the U.S. as well. The, the, it's a great example. The Navy SEALs are the bravest, are none. There, there isn't a braver person in the world than someone who makes it through what's called BUDS, the SEAL training. They can rock it out of the back of an airplane in the dark over a stormy ocean at 30,000 feet and not even think twice about you know, parachuting down into enemy territory. And that's because they've trained extensively in the best training in the world on physical courage yeah. now there's a what i call a terror triangle on one side of it is physical courage on the other side uh is emotional courage and on the bottom is instinctual courage and a lot of the the, the people i've worked with who are highly physical physically courage, courageous whether it's you, you know um free ride skiers or navy seals have had two or three marriages have had uh, you know broken relationships because they never learned the emotional courage. They didn't learn how to be vulnerable. They didn't learn how to share you know authentic feelings. And then uh, many people, of course, have instinctual fears like the you know fear of snakes or fear of spiders, even even though the risk of it is is minuscule. But um, and I, so I think every fear that we have is some combination of those three things. Yeah. And and unless you really work on that emotional courage, but you see some uh, you see some incredible executives, some incredible leaders, and and Richard Branson, who's one of my favorite people in the world, is a great example of you know if you read any of his books or you see his podcast of how he he told people to walk in. Uh, you know, when they had their initial recording studio and he said, listen, we better enjoy this recording because it's probably going to be our last one. I'm really afraid we're going to go bankrupt. And that's not pounding your, you know, your fist on the thing saying, do this right. We got to make this one work. It's up to you guys. You know, it's a totally different vulnerable. Hey, we, this, this might be it. You know, it might be the end. So let's make the most of it. So you can definitely see that or see that in someone, you know, I mentioned Gandhi before, that you can't find anyone in more courageous than sitting down in front of a, a, you know, an army vehicle, just putting his life on the line passively. I mean, that's just an incredible example. But to do that, Chris, and, and this is one of the things that I want to make sure I leave with your audience, we have to replace judgment with curiosity. We have to realize that when we see something on the TV, and we immediately think, oh, I can't believe those assholes are out there. You stop and you say, okay, what can I find really admirable about these people? What can I find that, that I, really, I really think they're suffering with? How can I be curious about this other person? And it doesn't matter how good or how bad. I have, I have a great friend and uh, she, she's worked with a lot of people uh, from this thing, this place called the Conscious Leadership Group. I swear she could she could find something good in a serial killer. Right? She's she's just the best at that, and she's incredibly happy, and and she just has this glow about her, and and people gravitate towards her, and so that's because she's become an absolute expert at replacing judgment with curiosity. And I hope I hope for everyone because I believe if we start to use our fear as fuel, and everyone can replace that judgment with curiosity, I think that's how we can get to world peace. I honestly do. Well, I know um, I could go on for hours. I know we're very, very short on time. So you mentioned um, Fear is Fuel, and that's the title of your book. Uh, do we have a couple of minutes just to talk about it? Um, it's, uh, I do, sure. Take, yeah. take a couple of minutes, Chris, absolutely. Fantastic. Um, so, yes, yeah, so tell us all about it. I mean, it's um, already been a Wall, Wall Street Journal bestseller, number five. Um, where did yeah. it come from? What made you want to turn your, your experiences into a book? So when I, uh, when I started talking to those neuroscientists um, after, after the initial one, I couldn't believe all this information uh, about the amygdala, about the SGACC, about the prefrontal cortex, about development in kids' age. Right? There's, it, it dramatically changed how I behaved as a parent, right, learning some of this information. And I said, uh, I was actually talking with an MIT neuroscientist, a guy named Earl Miller, 
who's uh, who did some first studies on multitasking, which which uh, you know he proved is completely impossible. Nobody can multitask. You have to do what's called multi switching. So he actually watched as you could keep different things in in your working memory. And it takes literally a second to switch back to something else, rewind your memory a little bit to get context, and then go forward. So, so literally, multitasking uh, decreases your efficiency pretty substantially. And so I was sitting there, and I said, why, isn't, why does anyone know about this? And we were talking about it over coffee, and, and his theory was that the neuroscience information so dry and, and so, so uh, scientific and banal and, and, and incredibly difficult to understand. And it gets published in obscure places that only academics you know, see, like the Journal of Neuroscience or you know, uh, Brain Technology or places like that. And so one of the things that I had done in my career as a CEO was I took very complex technology and made it very simple. And I thought, wow, the world really needs to understand these complex uh, situations. So I, I would, I, I've got a great story from the University of College London. One of my favorite neuroscientists is probably one of the smartest guys in the world. And, and he's definitely going to get a Nobel Prize. So his name's Carl Fritzen. And uh, I love visiting Carl. And I go, I take a, a, a video recorder and I record on my phone. And I'll sit with Carl and I'll usually ask him one or two questions and he'll talk for an hour. <laughs> and then I go home and I've been studying neuroscience for six, for six years. I go home and I have to listen to those recordings at least three or four times, taking notes, writing things down. just So I can then, you know, I do, I try and explain it to my wife, my kids who are teenagers to see if I can make the concept simple enough so that someone who isn't in neuroscience can understand. And that was the big motivation for the book. If I can take all this information, I can make it accessible for anyone, even if you're not a neuroscience. So there's a lot of great stories about Beryl Markham, the first woman to fly uh, transatlantic um, west to east, uh, or Carly Farina, the, the woman who became the most powerful CEO in the world, and, and uh, Mark Shapiro, who's the president of the Toronto Blue Jays, um, uh, baseball teams. So I've tried to weave in the examples of how the neuroscience works with some nice stories. And so that was the motivation for the book, make it, make it interesting to read, but really provide some great steps that anyone can use to change their life and, and help them live this life of their dream. Fantastic. Well, I, I will wrap it up there. There's just, I wanted to end on a quote. You probably heard it already. I think it's um, Greek philosopher Thucydides. And he okay. said, um, yeah. Uh, happiness comes from freedom and freedom comes from courage. And I think, you know, if we can train ourselves to recognize when fear is holding us back and have courage to step forward, then, you know, we can potentially achieve anything. So um, I'm going to be picking up a copy of your book and uh, teaching myself to overcome all my fears. So I really appreciate your time today. Thank you ever so much for that. Well, Chris, thank you all very much. And if people are interested, they can go to the website, which is pjsweeney.com and uh, see all about the, the things we have on offer there, master classes and uh, uh, the blog that has a weekly update on the newsletter. Or if you're on Instagram right now, go ahead and follow me at The Fear Guru. And uh, I do updates and, and often live casts and, and that sort of thing usually once a week as well. So thank you so much, Chris, and thank you all for taking the time to tune in. I really appreciate it. And, and I hope uh, you found some use out of this and things you can put to work today in your own life. Absolutely. Thanks ever so much for that. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Hope you found that useful. Uh, we had to cut it short in the end because Patrick is a very busy man, so I'm very grateful for his time today. If you want to find out more about Patrick and his philosophy about fear, he is at pjsweeney.com. He is on Twitter, at pjsweeney, and his book, Fear is Fuel, is available everywhere now. Check it out. And also, take a moment to look at your own fear and understand that most of the time, 99% of the time, is not real. It's an illogical thing. And see where it's stopping you from reaching out to other people, to taking the chances and the risks to, to live a fuller life and to be happier, more fulfilled, and that little bit closer to living your potential.